Good morning, everyone. We're ready for our program in organic chemistry. To me, that would be very, very challenging because it's such a big field. How do you cover it in one hour? <laughs> Let's see. Anyway, we have today Dr. Susan Meshwitz. She earned a PhD in organic chemistry from Brown University and did postdoctoral work at Harvard Medical School in biochemistry. She has worked as a research scientist in industry in the field of drug discovery for several years. Dr. Meshwitz has taught organic chemistry for the past 15 years, first at the University of Rhode Island, then Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, where she has been for the past seven years. Her research focuses on the design and synthesis of novel antibiotics. Let's welcome Susan Meshwitz. Thank you, Liz. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure. I, I always welcome the opportunity to share my passion for organic chemistry with anybody who's willing to listen. So I really <laughs> grab that opportunity. And um, it's a pleasure also because as I stand up here getting ready to kind of lecture on organic chemistry, it's uh, very refreshing to look out and see these faces that I know are eager to learn <laughs> something about organic chemistry. I'm used to seeing the faces of my organic chem students who are, well, fear, apprehension, um, really only usually worried about what that horrible course is going to do to their GPA, or is it going to ruin their chances of getting into medical school, right? So not having to worry about GPAs and med medical school applications, we can kind of just sit back and relax. and. Um, kind of learn about the wonderful world of organic chemistry. No pop quiz. <laughs> well, I heard, I, I heard there's some trivia, and you were supposed to be paying attention. So. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, so overview of my presentation, just to let me get you through what we're going to look at here. Um, I'm going to just start out talking about organic chemistry and the importance of organic chemistry. You'll be surprised as to how ubiquitous it really is. You know, it's all around us. Um, definitions. Organic chemistry is like a, it's another language. So can't get away from getting into some of these definitions and learning some of the language of organic chemistry. Um, the carbon atom, we'll see that organic chemistry revolves around the element carbon. So we'll talk about some of the um, special uniqueness, the unique characteristics of carbon and, and why that's so. Um, organic chemistry being such a broad field, um, is organized. It's a, it's a really nice organized um, study. And so functional groups are how organized, uh, how organic chemistry is organized. So we'll talk about and go through all the different functional groups. Then we get into one aspect of organic chemistry, the organic reactions, and then one specific branch of organic chemistry that uses the organic reactions, synthetic organic chemistry, and that's kind of my field. Um, okay. So important roles of organic compounds. So first starting off, I mean, life itself wouldn't be possible without organic chemistry. So I'm going to just go through some of the places where you'll find organic compounds. The molecules of life, carbohydrates, our main sources of energy, lipids, fat molecules. These are our storage forms of energy, um, important in the structure of cell membranes, uh, proteins, uh, building blocks of muscle, lots of, lots of roles of proteins. Um, they catalyze all our reactions that take place in the body, their enzymes, their um, transport molecules, nucleic acids, the DNA and RNA molecules that are important for carrying our genetic information and heredity. So those are all organic compounds. Um, then you get into uh, molecules that provide us with heat and energy, all of the petroleum products the heat and energy that we need to heat our homes and run our cars and all that other good stuff. Um, these are all organic compounds also. Um, naturally occurring in synthetic medicines, all the medicines that you take um, are also organic compounds. Many of the advances in medicine have been advances in organic chemistry. Um, synthetic polymers, these man-made molecules that have really increased our standard of living on the modern conveniences that we really get used to, all the plastics that we have out there with all the different roles, textiles. We have so many different kinds of synthetic fabrics now, especially in the athletic area where, you know, this 
particular material sweeps away the moisture and keeps you dry and, and all that other good stuff. These are all synthetic um, organic compounds and all the rubber products that we have also. Uh, many of the active ingredients in personal hygiene products, shampoos, detergents, cosmetics are also organic compounds. And then finally, there's lots of materials that are organic compounds that are used in artificial body parts, dentures, heart valves, hip knee replace, uh, prostheses, things like that. So organic chemistry really is all around us. It it's, um, plays a, a big, big role in our lives. Okay, so organic chemistry. What is organic chemistry? Organic chemistry is the study of carbon-containing compounds, study of the structure and the properties of those compounds. Whereas inorganic chemistry, on the other hand, is the study of all the other elements. So organic chemistry really just focuses around that carbon atom, that carbon element carbon. There are about 10 million different known organic compounds as opposed to about 250,000 different um, inorganic compounds. So um, actually, I want to skip over to here. With the periodic table, I mean, you can't talk about chemistry without taking a look at that periodic table. But just want to point out, you know, we talk about organic chemistry being centered around the carbon atom. That's one element on that periodic table where there's about 110 now known elements. So there's got to be something really special about carbon that all the other elements don't have, that um, we have this whole field of organic chemistry centered around carbon. So I'm going to be looking at what is it about the carbon atom that makes it so special. So two major reasons for the astonishing number of organic compounds. First thing has to do with the bonding characteristics of carbon, how it forms bonds, um, which is going to be very different, we'll see, from a lot of the other elements. And then something called isomerism of carbon-containing compounds. And this leads to a variety of different structures that carbon can make. So the bonding characteristics of carbon. Carbon has, and I'm, not going, to, I'm going to try to not get too detailed here, um, you know, my goal really is to give you a working knowledge of organic chemistry and without hopefully overwhelming you. Um, but for valence electrons, these are the electrons that are involved in forming bonds when atoms come together to form molecules. Carbon has four of those valence electrons, and so it forms four covalent bonds. So these are a, a, a type of bond where the electrons are shared as opposed to in inorganic chemistry, most of the bonds are ionic bonds. But the four is really, the, you know, it's a magic number. There's not very many elements on the periodic table that consistently in all their molecules form four bonds. Um, carbon uh, also forms bonds to, first of all, other carbon atoms. And then the only other elements really on that periodic table, remember the 110 elements, um, that, are, that you find in organic molecules are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and then all the elements that are in group seven, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So really, that's all it. That's, you know, and I always point that out to my organic students who've just come from Gen Chem and have you know, worked with the whole periodic table, that here, we're just going to focus on this little part of the periodic table um, for the whole um, year of organic chemistry. The other thing that carbon atoms can do, it can form bonds. When, they, when carbon atoms bond to each other, they can bond to each other and form chains, so long chains of carbon atoms. Branches, so long chains with branches hanging off of the, that chain. Carbon atoms can form rings when it, when it um, bonds to each other. And then we have what are called multiple bonds. So we'll look at single, double, and triple bonds. So, I mean, you can start to see the reasons that there's so many different organic compounds as opposed to these inorganic compounds. Um, and the other thing about organic chemistry and that language is you're going to be seeing lots of structures. So you can't really get away from that. Um, you know, when you're, when you're talking about organic chemistry, it's really the study of all these different molecules and the structures of these compounds. Um, so carbon forms strong carbon-carbon bonds and strong carbon-hydrogen bonds. Um, and again, this there's really no limit to the number of carbon atoms that can bond to each other, so we can, it can build up that scaffold for other atoms to bond to. And the other important thing about carbon um, is that it can form very easily five- and six-membered rings, and you'll see lots of structures with those ring structures. And, and nitrogen and oxygen can't do that. 
Um, so I've got just some samples here of structures, just trying to get used to um, how organic chemists draw these structures. Um, carbon will always have four bonds. We do get a little lazy if I, let me just go to the next slide here for a second here, but in, in terms of representing organic compounds, this is uh, what's called an expanded structural formula. So you're showing all the bonds in the molecule. Um, you're drawing a big molecule that gets kind of cumbersome. So organic chemists like to take some shortcuts. We have con condensed structural formulas. Oh, I don't know why they got cut off. But um, this compound here, so we have one, two, three, four carbons. This is another way of representing that one up there, showing all the bonds. And then even I can condense that further put those two CH2s in the middle there together. So we have lots of little shortcuts to draw these structures. So in the previous, going back to that previous slide for a second, this is just an example. I mentioned chains, branches, and rings. So chains of carbons right after another. This is actually another shortcut that we like to take. Um, I told you that carbon is the most important element in organic chemistry. And here we go, and we leave out the carbons. But it's understood that every little point here is a carbon atom. And then it's also known that every carbon has four bonds. So guess what? That carbon, that little line right there means that there's a carbon with three hydrogens attached. That's the CH3. So we, can, we have nice little shortcuts. Here's a branched, so carbon chain with some branches hanging off. And then that six-membered ring structure. Carbon can also form rings, too. Um, so that's how we depict those types of molecules. So there is no limit to the number of carbon atoms that can bond to each other. And so you'll see with organic molecules, it ranges from the very simple to, if you look on the right, left-hand side, one carbon. That's the simplest organic molecule. That's methane you find in natural um, gas. So it's the simplest. And then ranging up to hundreds or thousands of carbon atoms in a molecule, like the structure of DNA, very intricate structure. So um, there's lots of variations um, in, in the structures that we have that um, carbon can form. I mentioned multiple bonds. So again, this adds to the variety of the types of compounds um, out there. Single bonds, just very simple. Carbon has all single bonds. But a carbon-carbon double bond that you see on the right-hand side, carbon can also form triple bonds to each other. And then that's a very special ring structure over there on the bottom right, the aromatic ring structure that you find in a lot of compounds in nature. Very stable system. You've got alternating single and double bonds around that six-membered ring. OK, so that was the bonding characteristics of carbon. I'm going to get into what isomerism is. Here's where you get some definitions coming at you. Um, carbon atoms can form more than one arrangement. So when these atoms come together to form a particular molecule, there's sometimes different ways that you can arrange those atoms and get a different structure. So I've got a simple example up here. Um, if you look at, this is what's called the molecular formula. So it tells you how many carbons, how many hydrogens, how many oxygens in your molecule. So I'm starting with something simple, C2H6O. But I can arrange those atoms in two different ways and we get what are called structural isomers. So the molecule on the left, the two carbons are bonded to each other, then comes the oxygen. This is the molecule for ethyl alcohol, which is found, that's the alcohol found in alcoholic beverages. Um, liquid at room temperature. So you'll see with the arrangement of the atoms, the particular arrangement of the atoms is going to give the molecule its specific properties. On the right-hand side, um, carbon, then the oxygen, then the carbon. So bonding arrangement is a little bit different there. This is dimethyl ether, gas at room temperature. So same molecular formula, very different properties. This is a propellant found in aerosols. So the arrangement of the atoms is very important um, for the functioning of the molecule. So I always like to tell my students, you've got to remember, structure determines function. And that's, that's really key to looking at organic chemistry. I'm going to just show you a couple of examples of other types of isomers. We looked at structural isomers. There are also isomers called stereo isomers. And this, these isomers have a much more subtle difference to them. You know, on the previous slide, you could see the arrangement of atoms was quite different. But with uh, stereo isomers, this is more of a spatial or three-dimensional three arrangement that's different from each other. And nature is very selective and can tell the difference, uh, very subtle differences between molecules. So this is an example. Um, you've got a carbon-carbon double bond in both of these molecules. 
and the four groups that are attached to each of those carbons are the same, two hydrogens and two of those COOH groups, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But the difference is the spatial arrangement relative to each other. In the first one, you've got the hydrogens on opposite sides of the double bond. This is called the trans isomer. And in the other one, you've got the hydrogens on the same side. It's called the cis isomer. Very different in terms of structure determines function. Um, the one on the left-hand side is actually an essential metabolite. We find that in our cells and the body. One on the right, toxic to cells. That just that little structural difference. Again, nature can tell um, and tell the difference between those two. And then one other type of um, isomer. Uh, these are also stereoisomers. These are called enantiomers. If you look at the two structures now, I mean, the only difference really is one sort of being right-handed, the other one being left-handed. These are mirror images of each other. So now the difference in structure is even, even more subtle than the other two that I've showed you. Um, and what's interesting, these are both carbone, because now all the atoms are really connected in the same way. Um, we just have, again, like your hands are the perfect examples of these chiral molecules. They're mirror images of each other. But you know how you can't put a right-handed glove on your left hand or a left-handed glove on your right hand? I mean, they're different. So they have sort of a uh, left-handed and a right-handed motion to them. But these two compounds are interesting. The, the R carbone smells like spearmint, and the S carbone smells like oil of caraway, what you find in like rye bread, those seeds. Um, so again, nature, very selective. And that really points out that our sense of smell is also chiral. So structure very much so determines function in organic chemistry. OK, so I'm going to move into um, the functional groups. As I told you, how organic chemistry is um, very, very organized. And there are 12 different functional groups. I'm going to bring you through each of them kind of quickly, just to get you familiar with the arrangements of atoms. But um, you'll see that there are just these characteristic bonding patterns that you find. And so, you know, with 10 million different organic compounds, we can start to categorize those compounds into one or two or three different functional groups. The functional groups are the reactive part of the molecule. So when I get into talking about organic reactions, all the reactions take place at the functional groups. And then also the functional group is responsible for giving that compound its specific chemical and physical properties. So I've got a few just up here for you. But let me just go through. Um, really, all I want you to get out of these next two slides are the names of the functional groups. It's kind of too small in here. But since I'm going to be taking you through each one and showing you in detail the specific arrangement of atoms, let's just look at the names. So we've got alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, aromatics, alcohols, ethers, amines, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, esters, and amides, 12 different um, families or classes of compounds. But the other thing to keep in mind are is the fact that most of the compounds that exist in nature don't contain just one functional group. So you have these polyfunctional compounds. Um, I mean, look at these very intricate, detailed structures here, but um, complex structures. But even so, functional groups still are going to determine the, the, the physical and chemical properties of the compounds. And a lot of these polyfunctional compounds play very essential roles in um, life processes. Um, but just, uh, again, examples, cholesterol, vitamin C, vitamin E, progesterone, lots of different functional groups. OK, so um, classifying the different types of compounds, hydrocarbons are the simplest types of organic compounds. Like the name suggests, hydrocarbon, they contain only hydrogen and only carbon, so just those two different um, elements. And then you can further classify the hydrocarbons into what are called the saturated hydrocarbons. So these contain only single bonds. And then on the other side, we have the unsaturated hydrocarbons, where you get into molecules that have double or triple bonds, or again, that aromatic ring. So alkanes are the simplest of all the organic compounds. We're going to see that they play. What I'll do when I bring you through each of these functional groups is show you the structure and then give you some examples of specific uh, specific examples of that functional group and how they're used. That's always the kind of the, the interesting part of organic chemistry are the um, practical uses of these compounds. So the alkanes 
really play quite a crucial role in the modern industrial society because, again, they are our primary source of fuel and energy, and they are raw materials for the manufacture of lots of different things, plastics and drugs and synthetic fibers. So even though being the simplest of compounds, um, they're quite useful also. Okay, I need to take a little aside here also. Naming organic compounds. Um, I could teach a whole class, a whole semester on naming, but obviously I don't have that time. I'm going to just give you again the basics of, of how you name an organic compound. Um, with there being 10 million different kinds of compounds out there, there needed to be some systematic way of naming so that you didn't come up with the same name for two compounds. So we have this um, system, this convention that was adopted by International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, so IUPAC for short. So it's the IUPAC Convention of Naming. I've put a website up there if you need any more information on that. But just to go through really simply, um, the way the naming system works is the number of carbons that are in the longest chain. There, ha there are these base names that, um, if you see the base name, like for instance, hept, that tells me that there's seven carbons in the longest chain. So there's a base for one carbon, two carbon, three carbons, meth, eth, prop. My students always have to memorize those for me. Um, but that tells you the number of carbons in the chain. Um, the ending of the name will tell me what functional group is present. So there's a specific ending. Ane tells me I'm working with an alkane compound, an ene, an alkene. And you can kind of almost guess just by looking at the ending what the functional group is. So for instance, in that top one, 3-methylheptene, I've got a seven carbon chain. The number is there because if I start counting the carbons from the left, at carbon number three, I have a branch. It's a one carbon branch. Meth stands for one carbon. So 3-methylheptane. Dropping down to the next one, I've got a double bond at 3, 8 carbons in a row, oct is 8, ending is ene for the double bond. I need a 3 to tell me where, so this would be position 3, 3 to tell me where that 2-carbon chain is, that's an ethyl group, and 3 to tell me where the double bond is in the chain, so 3-ethyl-3-octene. Um, the next one is an alcohol, so the ending ol, five carbons in the chain. The OH group is at position number two. So two pentanol, change the ending there. So you kind of get the idea. Um, ending for an aldehyde, AL, ending for what we call a ketone is ONE. So that's kind of how the system works. Um, okay, so back to those functional groups. The um, next in the hydrocarbons are the alkenes, carbon-carbon double bond. And um, just a simple example up here, ethylene gas, which is a hormone produced by fruit involved in the ripening process. And I don't know if you know this, but in fact, you can take a, a piece of fruit that's not quite ripe yet, put it in a bag with fruit that's ripe, and the ethylene gas that's being produced by that ripe fruit will ripen your, your uh, fruit that's not ripe. It's a little trick, and actually does work. So that's ethylene, carbon-carbon double bond. Um, now, a more complex example of an alkene I've got up here is lycopene, which is um, an antioxidant. You'll be hearing lots more about antioxidants from Dr. Neto. Um, but antioxidant, it's kind of in the news a lot today. You know, if you're thinking about your health, a lot of different compounds have antioxidants. Uh, a lot of them are responsible for the colors that you see. So lycopene in watermelon and in tomatoes, responsible for the colors of those fruits. Um, but antioxidants help prevent cancer and heart disease. You've got 13 double bonds in this compound. Alkynes, carbon-carbon triple bond. Um, not very common in nature. Um, but anyway, the, the simplest I've got up there is acetylene. That's a compound that's used as fuel for torches and in making plastics. But I did find one example of a compound that has a, a, actually two triple bonds. I've got them pointed out over there. This is calichiomycin, which is uh, one of the most potent anti-tumor agents known. In fact, as when I did my postdoc, I worked on a compound not called neocarzinostatin, which also had triple bonds in it, kind of related to this compound. It's an enediene type of antibiotic, actually used in Japan um, as a chemotherapeutic agent. Not here in this country, though. Alcohols have um, in their functional group the hydroxyl group, so that OH group is called a hydroxyl group, so all the alcohols have that. Ethanol, one of the simplest ones found in alcoholic beverages. Menthol is another example that you find in cough drops, so I've got the structure down there. 
Um, and then other important alcohols, a little more complex. Glucose, our main source of energy, um, actually has five hydroxyl groups on that structure. And then another antioxidant, resveratrol, that you find in um, the skin of red grapes. You've got three hydroxyl groups on that compound, another double bond, two aromatic rings. Um, resveratrol is the reason that wet red wine is actually so good for you. So I always keep that in mind when I have my glass of wine. Aldehydes and ketones, I put these two together. Um, they have what's called a carbonyl functional group, that carbon-oxygen double bond. And the difference between aldehydes and ketones is just this hydrogen. If you've got a hydrogen directly attached there, you've got an aldehyde. Um, no hydrogen, you've got a ketone. So they're very um, similar to each other. Very common also in biological compounds. And also, many of them have very fragrant odors um, that are used in flavorings. So vanilla and butter flavor I've got up there, two different um, aldehydes and ketones. Carboxylic acids is the next functional group. This contains what's called a carboxyl group. You've got the carbon-oxygen double bond, this time with a hydroxyl group attached to that carbonyl. Um, these compounds tend to have a very tart, sour taste. Not that we're tasting compounds anymore, but way back before we had all these, I tell my students, please don't taste them. You know, it'll say in the textbook, has a sour taste or feels slippery, bases feel slippery. Please don't put them on your skin and please don't taste them. Just take our word for it, you know. But they used to do that back in the olden days when we didn't have all these techniques to um, figure out structures. It's like, mm, I think this one's an acid. Let me taste it. Yeah. But anyway, so the carboxylic acids are, um, do have that sharpness to them. So acetic acid that you find in vinegar is a carboxylic acid. Citric acid that you find in citrus fruits, carboxylic acid. Um, this is a group of carboxylic acids that's used in the cosmetics industry. You can't, you can't pick up cream, face cream or whatever nowadays without finding that they contain these alpha hydroxy acids that are basically supposed to be reducing wrinkles. I don't know. I, 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 I use them. I mean, I don't know if they work, but I'm going to not you know, question that and I'm going to just keep using them. But they work as an exfoliator, um, so they're kind of just sloughing off the, the dead skin cells um, and rejuvenating your skin a little bit. But these are glycolic acid, lactic acid um, are the alpha hydroxy acids that both contain a carboxylic acid functional group and then also the OH, the hydroxyl from that alcohol. Esters, some of my favorite compounds. Um, carbon oxygen double bond and then you have an O, I don't think I've used that R group yet, but the R group is just a general abbreviation for any carbon-containing group, so you've got an O-carbon attached to that carbonyl. Um, esters are key structural features in fats and oils, I'll show you in a second, but m a, a lot of the esters, especially the smaller, low molecular weight ones, have very fruity and flowery fragrances and odors. Um, so they're found in fruits and you oftentimes used as flavoring agents um, in foods and in scents and perfumes. So I've shown you a few of them here. Um, so as I mentioned, esters are important in the structure of fats and oils. This is the structure of uh, triglyceride, which is the, the main type of structure that you find in all your fats. But I've pointed out here the ester linkage, which there's actually three of them. So that ester functional group, very important in nature. And then lastly are two functional groups. These are the nitrogen-containing functional groups, amines and amides. Um, so these are also very abundant in nature. They play important roles in the chemistry of life. And these two functional groups are found in more medications than any other functional groups. Amines, shown on the left, are really just organic derivatives of ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, so if the hydrogens are replaced by some carbon-containing alkyl group, um, you get an amine. And then on the right-hand side, there's that carbonyl group again, carbon-oxygen double bond. If there's a nitrogen directly attached to that, you have an amide. And um, as I mentioned, they're very important in the chemistry of life because their structures, the, these functional groups are found in the structures of most of our biomolecules. Um, so the amide functional group shown on the bottom here um, forms the backbone of all of our protein structures. So in our proteins are built up, uh, the building blocks are amino acids and all the amino acids are connected to each other by way of an amide functional group. 
And then amines, both amines and amides are present in the structure of nucleotide bases, which are part of the structure of the DNA and the RNA molecules. So, um, and I think that's probably the reason that there's um, nitrogens, the amines and amides are found in more medications than any other functional group is because structure-wise, those functional groups are also found in the important biomolecules. This is just an example of some of the medications that do contain amines and amides. Okay, so moving now into an important aspect of organic chemistry, and that is the organic reactions. We just got finished taking a look at all the different functional groups in organic chemistry. The organic reactions allow, essentially allow one functional group to be converted into another functional group. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think about the functional groups, they are the site of chemical reactivity in a molecule. Um, so there's lots of different organic reactions, um, quite a big variety. I'm going to just kind of list and, and talk briefly about three of the main types of reactions, um, the addition reactions, substitution, and condensation reactions. And many of these, again, they take place um, chemical life processes. I mean, all the reactions that are going on in, in our body are really just organic reactions that are happening. So the addition reaction is a pretty simple one. It converts a double bond into a single bond. Something can add, a little mole molecule can add across that double bond. This is the hydrogenation reaction. So if hydrogen adds across that double bond, um, you convert an alkene to an alkyne. And this is the reaction that's actually used in the production of margarine from uh, vegetable oils. Substitution reactions. These are very versatile reactions um, and can um, allows basically for a variety of transformations. So in a substitution reaction, one functional group gets substituted for another. So I have here just an, an alk what's called an alkyl halide. So this bromine, as you can see, can be replaced by any of those groups, and then you get a new functional group in the end. So I have an alkyl halide being converted either into an alcohol, Thiols I didn't talk about as a functional group, but those are the sulfur-containing compounds. Um, if you've ever smelled the skunk, um, that's what you're smelling as a thiol type of compound, very distinct smells. Um, nitriles, ethers, alkynes. So really, really versatile type of reaction. And then the third reaction is the condensation reaction. And this reaction is really important in biochemistry. Um, when all of our... Um, when, we, when our cells are converting our small molecules up into bigger proteins and carbohydrates um, and, and fats, these are con condensation reactions. Two molecules come together, a, a molecule of water is removed, so carboxylic acid and an amine. You can see I've highlighted where the water is. Water is just H2O. So if you remove a molecule of water and then reconnect that carbon and nitrogen, you get that amide linkage. And again, this is how proteins are, are built up in um, our cells. Um, moving now into a specific branch of organic chemistry that focuses on using those chemical reactions, so synthetic organic chemistry. Um, if, if you're doing research in this area, usually you're doing one of two things. You're either trying to develop new synthetic methodologies, trying to come up with new types of reactions, um, or maybe improve, trying to improve on known reactions, more efficient ways of doing things. That would be one area. The other thing um, that takes place in this area of research is using known reactions to synthesize or build target molecules um, from readily available starting materials. If that target molecule is a natural product, then this is referred to as total synthesis of natural products. Um, so that's the practice of designing um, novel synthetic routes to very complex molecules. Um, the advantage of doing, uh, of getting hold of a natural product that way is that you have a ready supply of usually what's our rare compounds. You know, if you're isolating, and again, you'll hear a lot about this from Dr. Netto, but if you're isolating compounds that are found in nature, um, it takes a lot of effort. And in the end, you get very little amounts of that stuff. So there's a great deal of research that's focused on um, total synthesis of these natural products and trying to just chemically make them in the lab. 
One of the most difficult parts of total synthesis is structure elucidation. So you're in the lab and you're trying to build these molecules, um, or even just doing a simple reaction. How do you know you have the product that you set out to make? Or how do you, you, know, how do you know that your reaction worked? So uh, you can't see it, right? So you need a way to determine what that structure is. And so I've listed just a couple of tools here that organic chemists use to help them determine structures of molecules. Uh, mass spectrometry, uh, known as MS, and I'll, I'll just tell you what pieces of information you get from these different tools. Um, mass spectrometry provides a chemist with the molecular mass of the compound, and then from that, you can work with that molecular mass and, and some of the other information that you get from mass spec and actually possibly come up with a molecular formula for the compound. So once you have a molecular formula, you know how many carbons, how many hydrogens, how many oxygens, nitrogens, or whatever are present in that molecule. So that's kind of a starting point. Um, you know, a lot of these tools, they're used kind of together um, to help figure out a structure. Infrared spectroscopy, IR, um, tells the chemist what functional groups are present in the molecule, and, and actually the reverse of that too. It's good for telling you what functional groups are not present in the molecule also. So that, again, is giving you another piece of information that's going to help you determine the structure. And probably one, the most, one of the most powerful tools is this last one here, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, or NMR. Um, this, actually, sometimes alone, you can figure out the structure of the molecule from the NMR spectrum if you're really good at reading them. Um, it takes a lot of practice, but um, NMR, there's two different types that chemists use to help figure out structure, proton NMR and carbon-13 NMR. And what these, what these um, spectra give you are information about the carbon-hydrogen framework. So they're going to tell you about the different types of carbons in the molecule, tell you about the different types of hydrogens in the chemical environment. So you can start to piece together, almost like putting together a jigsaw puzzle when you look at one of these. Um, do I have it next now? I'll show you some spectra in a minute. But it's almost like trying to just do a jigsaw puzzle, because all of these things will give you little pieces of information about your structure and then you can start to put them back together and, and come up with a possible structure. I do have listed here a couple of spectral databases that organic chemists um, use for organic compounds. The first one is um, n useful only in the sense that, not really for sort of an unknown compound, but um, it, it lists here, you can find the IR, NMR, and mass spec data for commercially available chemical reagents um, from C6 to C16. So it's very specific, but it's very useful when we're doing reactions in the lab and, and you get your spectra of your product, but you know, maybe it would be nice to see the spectra for your starting material. So if you're starting with commercially available reagents, you can get that information and then at least compare um, your product and your starting materials. You have a starting point to begin with. Um, the next one, NMR Shift Database. Actually, what's interesting about this website is you can upload a structure, and not for every structure, but it, it works pretty well. You can upload a structure, and it might be able to predict what the NMR spectrum would look like for you. So that's awful, you know, helpful information also. ChemSpider, one of my favorites. Um, lots of spectra that you can look up there, and much, much more information too. Lots of good information from ChemSpider. Okay, I am going to finish up with two examples of how synthetic organic chemistry has been used in the drug development field. And I'm going to start with a simple molecule, aspirin. And in fact, aspirin, um, the synthesis of aspirin really started the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so it's a very simple structure, as you can see on the bottom right-hand side not really that complex, you've got this carboxylic acid functional group, you have an ester functional group, and then that aromatic ring. Um, it turns out that uh, aspirin, or acetyl salicylic acid, is really a synthetic derivative of this compound here, salicylic acid. This is a natural product that's found in the bark of willow trees, and before the 1800s, people used to actually chew on willow bark 
um, they knew that there was something in there that helped relieve their pain. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it worked. But the problem with this compound here, salicylic acid, this couldn't be marketed as a, as a medication because it was very irritating to the lining of the stomach. Um, so there was a chemist that worked in a German chemical company, the Bayer chem Chemical Company, which is the same company that um, produces and distributes Bayer aspirin. Um, he had the idea, and in fact, Bayer Chemical Company back then in the 1800s was a dye chemical company. They were in the production of dyes, and that's really kind of how the chemical industry started. Um, but he had the idea that maybe if he tweaked the structure a little bit of salicylic acid, do a little bit of organic chemistry on it, maybe he could come up with something that, number one, retained the um, pain-relieving and anti-inflammatory properties, but on the other hand, was going to be a little more tolerated. He felt um, that it was probably this hydroxyl group that was causing um, the problems and, and the irritation to the lining of the stomach. So he had the idea of, why don't I just take this hydroxyl group and substitute it with an ester group? And that's what he did. And lo and behold, acetyl salicylic acid retains the, the pain relieving properties, still is an anti-inflammatory, but much, uh, much more well tolerated. Um, so some of that irritation was reduced. And as I said, this really was the beginning of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, he worked for Bayer. Bayer then started to market little packets of this powder. Um, and you know, we still can buy Bayer aspirin today. Um, oh, this is uh, what IR data and NMR data look like. I thought I would just give you some simple examples. Um, but there's the structure again of acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin. But um, the IR spectrum, again, will tell you about a functional group presence. So these little bands here, this, this little bit, well, big band, this broad band here actually is telling me that there's a carboxylic acid functional group in that molecule. That, you know, one of those peaks and one of these peaks in here, I can put those together and tell me that. In proton NMR spectrum, uh, in the spectrum, each of these signals represents one of the types of hydrogens in that molecule. So again, you, you learn to read these and figure out, you know, depending upon where that signal comes, that tells me about the chemical environment of, the, of a particular hydrogen in that molecule. And then the second example I want to use of synthetic organic chemistry is taxol. This is a much more complex structure, as you can see. The structure over there, you've got four different ring systems on the right-hand side, lots of functional groups in here. Um, Taxol is another natural product and also found in the bark of a tree, this time the Pacific yew tree. Um, it was isolated back in 1969 and found to have very potent anti-cancer properties. And it is used as a chemotherapeutic drug, mainly to treat breast cancer, also some lung and ovarian cancers. Um, the problem, however, is when that compound is isolated from the bark, um, you, it basically kills the tree in the process. So the harvesting process, um, the, the scarcity of taxol and the ecological impact of harvesting that compound uh, really posed a problem for bringing this compound to market and having it be used as a chemotherapeutic agent. So those two things then really um, kind of started a the, the search for a synthetic route to this compound. And it took about 20 years of research. Um, about 30 different research groups were involved in trying to come up with a chemical synthesis, trying to make this compound in the lab. Um, and actually, this, I thought I took this one out. But anyway, there's the proton spectrum of Taxol. And really, my point here was basically to say, you know, look at that structure, pretty complex. But even that NMR spectrum of Taxol, um, there are some really distinguishable peaks there. I mean, you can get a lot of information from that proton NMR, um, even with a really, really complex structure. But um, OK, so the chemical synthesis of Taxol. Now, with all that research that was done, finally in 1994, a total synthesis was published of Taxol. However, it wasn't really a very practical total synthesis. It was a matter of about 40 steps from start to finish, not a very good overall yield, um, not really a practical way to bring it to market. 
Um, but what was found was that there was another um, compound, another natural product um, called bacetin-3. This compound, similar in structure to taxol, just missing that left-hand portion of the molecule. This compound, readily available, found in the needles of another yew tree, the European yew tree. So harvesting of that compound doesn't sacrifice the tree. So that, this compound is readily available. So the taxol that's actually marketed today and used today is a compound that comes from a semi-synthesis. So it's not the total synthesis product, but a semi-synthesis from this derivative, this compound here, um, easily made in just a couple of steps from this compound. However, you know, the whole, all that research that was put into trying to come up with a total synthesis of taxol, and in many cases this happens, the um, chemical synthesis leads to not only a route to the production of the natural product, but along the way you learn things about the structure, and it leads to um, a, a road to a variety of related structures. Oftentimes, some of these related structures turn out to be even more potent, more active than that natural product. And that's what happened in um, all the research that was done with Taxol, that there's this compound, docetaxel, which is a synthetic derivative of Taxol. So differs, I've got some arrows there, differs in structure only at two different places. But many studies have shown this compound to be even more effective than Taxol. So that's you know, one of the things with total synthesis is you've got now leeway to start tweaking the structure a little bit and maybe even coming up with something that's um, more effective. So just finishing up with this, this um, section on total synthesis. So why synthesize? The advantages that come from total synthesis. Number one, it gives you an unlimited source of the material, right? So you don't have to try to just rely on that product that's isolated. Um, oftentimes, you can come up with more effective derivatives, fewer side effects, some compounds um, that are slightly different in structure might, as long as it retains its potency, also maybe have fewer side effects. Um, increased solubility, solubility is often an issue in um, the pharmaceutical industry. And then also, um, just designing new drugs. I mean, there's lots of drugs that we take that aren't, the structures are not related, or, or, or um, related to a natural product at all, but just sort of designed um, as a drug that way. So um, I come to the end of the presentation, but I bring you back to the first slide here because I just want to kind of reemphasize the fact that it, it truly is a wonderful world that we live in, but now hopefully you have the appreciation of the fact that this world is filled with the wonders of organic chemistry. Thank you, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? I guess we have time for a few questions if you have any. We can go to uh, 10.35. Okay. Any questions? I have one question. What was the alkaloid on the first slide? What was the alkaloid on my first slide? I think it was, um, I have to look back now, it might have been caffeine. Let me look. Ah. Uh, Gee, I wish I had that answer for you. Like, I don't even know what I put up there. Let me see. You just show us. We can look it up. Yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Um, this is caffeine. Is this the one you're talking about? Yes. Caffeine. Progesterone, methane, and here's my taxol structure. And this right here is resveratrol. We talked about that. But yep, this is caffeine. Any other questions? <laughs> Hope I didn't, like I said, overwhelm you. Another question? Okay, you next. Thank you very much. I, I think I I finally understand the, the stuff that I learned in organic <laughs> chemistry <laughs> now. <laughs> it was you know, it was not presented as logically as this. Oh, so, well. Um, thank you. So I, I, I don't know that I have a question so much as Do you want to just I'm say just that? Well thank you. Appreciative. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Oh, all right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Question right there. Question. Yeah. Um, you showed uh, two um, compounds that had this, they were di different organizations of the same components. Yes. And so they had the same um, 
notation. Yes. How in, say, the literature do you distinguish between those or make sure that you don't get things mixed up in, uh, um, in the wrong way? So if you were just using the molecular formula, right, so the, the numbers of carbons, the numbers of hydrogens, the numbers of oxygens, um, it would be easy to get those mixed up. So I think if you went to the literature with just a molecular formula, you would probably find that, okay, here are all the possibilities of the compounds that have this molecular formula. And of course, the more complex the molecular formula gets, more carbons, more hydrogens, the longer that list gets. So, I mean, that's a good question because when you are doing that structure elucidation and you use mass spec and you get the possible molecular formulas, um, that, you know, that gives you a little bit of information, but you've got lots of possibilities um, there. And so that's why you have to use those other tools, especially the NMR, to kind of help you figure out, okay, well, what structure do I have? Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Sure. Hi. Um, can you think back to your undergraduate days when you were first taking this stuff and tell us what was the biggest struggle back then? We've been talking about women in science and yeah. where they leave the pipeline and all of that stuff and also trying to think about how to help today's students. So what was the struggle for you? You mean like just for organic chemistry or just yeah, chemistry or, in or in undergrad in general, undergrad yeah, chemistry? Um, study habits, I think, you know, I, and, and I'm just kind of trying to think of what I tell my students too. Um, you know, one of the first things I tell them with organic chemistry is you are going to struggle through this. And struggling is good because you come out on the other side better for it. I think the problem with students today is they don't have the perseverance. They, everything's instant, instantaneous. You know, all that technology that we have, everything is instant. Um, but with subject matters like this and, and, and math, and they need to be able to sit down for 20 minutes maybe or more and work on a specific problem and they don't, they seem to just not have that perseverance. Um, so, you know, that I think is one of the biggest struggles. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. It wasn't really a question. I just thought I'd help out some of these people that aren't organic chemists uh, sure. or that know anything about organic chemistry since I teach information retrieval. Um, that formula business. Yes. Of course, it's called Hill Notation. It's, it actually resolves a, a huge chemical formula into a simple way for you to find it in an index. It oh, isn't really? specific, yeah. but you can, you know, if you as a person trying to help an organic chemist right. have the Hill formula and you combine it with something that you know in the name, you can usually oh. come up with a chemical, but that's how we index okay. organic chemicals yeah. is by taking, you take all the carbons and count them, you take all the hydrogens and count them, then all the rest of the elements, you arrange them in alphabetical order and count them, and it becomes an indexing tool. Oh, wonderful, that's, that's great, thank you for that. Yes? Yes, in my past life, I was a science librarian, oh. and I used the Stadler a lot, the NMR and the IR indexes. Okay, yes. And it was always a challenge to try to figure out exactly what it was. Yes. Um, so let's say in a medical library, we may not have access to those indexes. Right. What, is there anything online that we could go to if someone came in with, with a, a spectrum? Yeah, a spectrum and said, uh, where would you go? Well, I had given a couple of those um, websites the NMR database websites. Let's see if I can bring those back up. Are right. these free or are they? Uh... Yes. Yep. The ones that I have um, listed here are. So structural elucidation. Here we go. Um, yes, they are free. So, I mean, each one of them works a little bit differently. The bottom two are probably the most useful. Um, Chem Spider. Again, you go in there. You can put in a molecular formula or you can put in some NMR data. Um, you don't always, a, a structure doesn't always pop up. I mean, it does depend on how complex it is. Or sometimes you can type in, which even, I think even more useful sometimes, is you can type in the name of a structure. And if there's an NMR data, NMR spectrum um, available that's online there, they'll show you that. Okay. Um, so that, that's kind of useful too. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And one of the notations that you might include is this right-handed and left-handed business that you mentioned in the spices. Uh, the R is one term, an S, not L for left-handed. 
That's, that's correct, yeah. So if you're looking at any of these, the other classic one is the thalidomide. Thalidomide, yeah, you're right, thank you. Any other questions? Great, well, all right, thank you.